Hi, welcome to another Real Time Faith lesson discussion for early teens class. It's a blessing and an honor as always to have you with me as we study together and learn from God's Word. Now this week's lesson, the topic is God's Witnesses. God's Witnesses. Now don't you think it's funny that we are God's Witnesses? Why does a great and mighty God need witnesses? For what purpose? What good are we as witnesses? I've been called to court as a doctor, and the judge and the prosecution, or the defense, the judge and the defense, especially if I am providing evidence against someone. So the judge and the lawyers who are protecting the one who is the perpetrator. The judge has to ascertain or establish my expertise. Am I an expert? Because in the court of law, it is only medical professionals who can give their opinion as experts, more or less. Everyone else's opinion does not count. They are not experts. So that for that one reason, we are allowed into court to provide evidence. Although we did not see the event, we can take the story from the person, we can examine them, and then we can come up with what we believe is best. And the judge will ask us about this expert advice, and we will present it to the court. And you see, my brothers and sisters, it is our experience that makes us experts. Now, as Christians, are we experienced enough? Do we have the credentials? Do we have the schooling, the background to be God's witnesses? How can we as mere human beings be God's witnesses? Don't you think that's funny? How can we as mere human beings testify for the great and mighty God of heaven? The one who has no beginning, the one who has no end, the one who brought all things into existence. Why does God need witnesses? And how can we testify for Him if we are His witnesses? Now, before we go further into this lesson, please close your eyes, bow your heads, and we'll pray together. Our gracious Father, our eternal God and King, please, Father, open our hearts and minds as we study your Word. And please, Father, make your Word understandable for every single one of us. Teach us and lead us. We ask you, Lord, this prayer in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen. Now, as I said, our lesson this week is God's witnesses. That is our lesson this week, God's witnesses. So in what ways are we God's witnesses? How can we truly testify for Him? Why does God need us as witnesses? Now, recently, the world celebrated Father's Day. The world celebrated Father's Day about a week ago. And I was asked to go and give a speech for my son at his school. Father's Day is a nice occasion. I know there are some Christians who may think that Father's Day is a pagan festival and we should forget about it. But my brothers and sisters, let me reason with you. It is always good to show honor to our fathers and mothers. It is always good to show honor to our children as well, to acknowledge them, to appreciate each other. So if there is an opportunity for us to appreciate each other, to show love, to show kindness, to show acts of goodness and kindness, then we should take it. So here, was an, here on Father's Day is an opportunity for us to show our goodness and our kindness to our parents, to our fathers, to our guardians, whoever may be playing the role of a father in our family. Now, my brothers and sisters, how would you show your kindness or appreciation to your father? How do you show it to your parents? We are supposed to show it every day, of course, not just one day a year. That's what makes us truly honor our parents, not just one day a year, but every single day. But how would you show your appreciation to your parents? Would it be buying gifts? Would it be taking them out to dinner? Would it be maybe doing something special for them? How do you show your appreciation to your father? 
You know, my brothers and sisters, God is also a father to us. In fact, God is our ultimate father, the one who brought all of us into being, the one who deserves our love and respect and our, our praise and our worship. He deserves everything. But my brothers and sisters, in Isaiah chapter 1, God puts forward a controversy. God puts forward a controversy and says that His people are not acknowledging Him. They are not acknowledging Him as God, as, as their Father. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me and let's have a look at this. In Isaiah chapter 1 and from verses 2 to 4, let us see the controversy that God is experiencing or God is putting forth to the people of the world. In Isaiah chapter 1 verses 2 and 4 it re verses 2 to 4 it reads, "Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord had spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doeth not know, my people doeth not consider." And in verse 3, it's, uh, verse 4, it says, Ah, sin sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Now here is an amazing thing. Here is something God cannot understand. And He is bringing this to his prophet Isaiah to tell the people, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. I have a controversy between my people and myself. My people have forgotten me. My people have gone away from me. My people have denied me as their father, as the one who provides for them, as the one who is their God. My people have rejected me. Why is this so? If the dumbest of animals can acknowledge their owners, if the dumbest of animals can acknowledge their masters, the cow, the cow is not smart at all, but the cow knows its master. And the donkey is even worse than the cow, but the donkey knows where its master's home is, where it will receive food from. You see, my brothers and sisters, although those animals are considered the dumbest of all animals, they know their owner. They know the one who provides for them. They know where home is. But here the children of Israel, the Lord is saying that they don't know Him. And this is not just to the children of Israel, but in fact to every single person. Everyone in this world has turned away from God. And God is bringing this controversy before us. The ones who I have brought up as a father, the ones who I have looked after and reared up, they have rejected me. They do not know me. They do not consider all these things and they have turned away from me. You see, my brothers and sisters, God is in anguish. God is in pain. The thing that pains a father the most or a parent the most is when children don't recognize them, is when children don't appreciate them, that they are the ones whom gave the, who gave them life, that they are the ones who brought them forth into the world, that they are the ones who provided for them, and that they are the ones who continue to provide and watch over them. You see, my brothers and sisters, in many societies, fathers and mothers are thrown into places where other people look after them because the family unit has broken down. People are just too busy to care for their fathers and mothers anymore. There is no remembrance of mom and dad. No recognition. My brothers and sisters, being a parent, it must be so painful to be rejected or forgotten by your own children, to not be appreciated by your own children, the one you have brought up, the ones you have reared up. And here God is feeling this pain. This is the thing that hurts Him the most. The people have turned away from Him and have chosen gods that don't hear gods that don't understand, gods that can't think or do anything. People worship entertainment. People worship sports. People worship idols made of metal and wood. People worship anything and everything that is not God. And here it pains God that He is not recognized. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, let me switch a bit. But this applies to the lesson, but let me just diverge a bit. The thing that hurts a parent the most is not being recognized. Now, let me ask you a question as we diverge a bit and come back to the point. Why did Jesus weep? Why did Jesus weep? Obviously, in John 11 verse 35, we have the shortest verse of the Bible and it says there, Jesus wept. And this was at the death of Lazarus, as they were leading him to the tomb. And the people were making comments and saying, If he opened the eyes of the blind, could he not have also saved this man? Could he not also have restored this man, so that he would not have died? Now, obviously, the people did not recognize Jesus. And along the way, Jesus grieves and moans with him himself. And then, finally, in verse 35, Jesus wept. Now, why do you think Jesus cried? Why do you think Jesus cried? Was it because he was sad for Lazarus? Now, let me ask you this question. If Jesus was truly sad for Lazarus, why would he cry if he knows that he is going to raise Lazarus, which we see later on? Jesus was actually there to wake him up. As he said earlier in, the, in John chapter 11, that I go to awake him. And the disciples thought he was sleeping so that he would get well. But Jesus said, no, Lazarus is dead. If Jesus knew he is going to wake Lazarus, why would he be crying? Why would he be grieving? Many of us grieve, or, or if not all of us grieve, for our loved ones, because they have died. And hope is not that obvious. Their resurrection is not that obvious. But here Jesus knew Lazarus would be raised again. So why did he cry? Was he sorry for Mary and Martha? Or was he sorry for the people around him? My brothers and sisters, the reason why Jesus cried, you will find in Luke chapter 19. If you have your Bibles there, we'll see another place where it clearly states that Jesus cried. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41. Now, the context of this is after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus riding on a donkey, and they hail him and welcome him as a king. And after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, Jesus makes his way up to the Mount of Olives. And along the way, Jesus cries. And it's recorded for us. Luke records it for us in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke 19. And we'll read from verse 41 of Luke 19. Now it says here in verse 41, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Jesus wept over it. This is the second occurrence of Jesus weeping in the Bible. Now why did he weep? Why did he cry? And the answer is found in the subsequent verses, in verses 42, 43, and 44, especially verse 44. If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Your peace is hidden from you, Jerusalem, and the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side. Jesus is pro prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem, because they have rejected him. And in verse 44, he continues to say, And shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Why was Jerusalem destroyed? Because they did not know the time of their visitation. They did not recognize the one who made them. They did not recognize the one who came to them, who was from everlasting to everlasting, the one who brought them to life, the one who gave them a spe special purpose and calling, the one who called Abraham, the one who blessed Isaac and blessed Jacob. Here was he before them. And they did not know him. They rejected him and eventually they killed him. And this is why Jesus cried, because they failed to recognize him. 
In John 1 verse 10 and 11 it says this, And he was in the world, and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. And then in verse 11 it says, And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus came to his people, the ones whom he had created, the ones whom he had called out of darkness into his marvelous light. He came to them, the ones he provided for, the ones he was a father to. He came to them and they rejected him. And it broke his heart and here he is on the Mount of Olives weeping. And it was the same at the funeral of Lazarus, at the place of Lazarus' burial. It was the same. Because the people did not recognize him, because they did not recognize that he had the power over death and he was the source of life, that he was the great God of heaven, the King, the Lord and Savior, because they did not recognize Jesus Christ, Jesus wept. That is the thing that breaks the heart of God more than anything, not recognizing the one who gives us peace not recognizing the one who gives us peace. And if we don't recognize him, then just like the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, their peace was hidden from them and they could not recognize it. My brothers and sisters, we are God's witnesses. We testify that he is our father, that he is the one who has brought us forth into this world. And in, if you look at Isaiah 43, If you come back to Isaiah 43, God is still continuing with this claim that He is our Father. He is the one who rightfully deserves our praise and worship, our appreciation. So in Isaiah 43 verses 10 to 12, this this is what it reads. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Even I, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared, or I have revealed, and have saved, and I have showed where there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and that I am God. We are God's witnesses that He is God. Now, who is this God that we are witnessing for? Is it just the Father? Is it just maybe the Godhead as an entirety, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Who specifically are we witnessing for? If you look at Isaiah 44, verse 6, it gives us a clue to who we are witnessing for. In verse 8, actually, in fact, it says the same thing that I am God and you are my witnesses. And in verse 6, it tells us who this God is, who we are testifying about, that He is God. In verse 6 of Isaiah 44, it reads, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. Who do you think this God is? Who is the first and the last? In the book of Revelation, Jesus says to his prophet John, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. My brothers and sisters, the God that we are to acknowledge as the God of heaven, the one who created all things, the one who brought forth all things, the one who keeps and sustains by his word, His mighty word of power is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus has given us all things. And this is why Isaiah in Isaiah 9 verse 6 calls him a special title as well. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is also called our Father. Not just our brother, but He is also called our Father in the sense that He is our Creator. He is our Redeemer. 
But being so humble, he points us back to his Father and tells us to call him our Father also and to give all worship and praise and honor and glory to his Father in heaven. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is the one who has created all things. He is the one who has brought forth all things. And doesn't he deserve our appreciation? Doesn't he deserve our recognition? Doesn't he deserve our praise and worship? My brothers and sisters, the argument he brought to Isaiah, the controversy he brought before Isaiah, my people don't know me. My people have forsaken me. They have gone after strange gods. My brothers and sisters, that is the case for many of us today. Don't you think it's time we appreciated the one who gave us all things? Don't you think it's time we appreciate the one who brought us to life? Don't you think it's time for us to appreciate the one who created us? And don't you think it's time we appreciated the one who saved us, who redeemed us? My brothers and sisters, when I went to present that speech at my son's school, I knew that there would be people there who were atheists, people who didn't believe in God. And I had a mixed audience to present to. But it was impossible for me to leave God out of my speech. When I wanted to use the greatest example of a father, I used the example of God. And God is not just our provider. God is not just our creator and sustainer, which is the role of a father. A father should provide and watch over and care for. But more so, God is someone who is present with us. And that was the message I left at the school. That is the message that is given through scriptures for us, that God wants to be with us. And any good father will want to be with his children. My brothers and sisters, we are witnesses that God is our Father. We are witnesses that Jesus Christ is our King and our Savior. We are witnesses that Jesus Christ is our Creator. We are witnesses that Jesus Christ is God also. He's not just a mere man, he's not just a prophet, but he is also God. My brothers and sisters, how do you and I show our appreciation to God? In verse 16 of Isaiah chapter 1, Jesus gives us the, the way, or he shows us the way, that we might show our appreciation for all that he has done. In verse 16 of Isaiah chapter 1, it says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, and in verse 17, learn to do well, Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. My brothers and sisters, how we show our love and appreciation for our Father in heaven, how we witness for Him, is by loving others, by not doing evil, by caring for the needs of others, providing for those who are oppressed, for lifting them up. That's how we show our love and care, not just in public, but also in our quiet spaces, in our private places, we show our witness to God, that He is God and King, by what we do in our secret places, in our own private time, in the chambers of our mind, the things we contemplate, the things we talk about, the things we watch, how we live our lives, how we take care of our bodies. All these things testify that we believe that God is who He says He is. My brothers and sisters, are you living a life that testifies that God is your King, that Jesus is your King, that Jesus is your Savior, that Jesus is your God? I thank you for joining me. I ask you now to close your eyes, bow your heads, and we'll pray together. Our gracious eternal Father, our God and King, please help us, Lord, not to reject you. Please help us to recognize you. Help us to give you the recognition that you deserve as our Father, our God and our King. We thank you so much for all that you have done. Please remind us that we are witnesses, not just to the people who are on this earth, the people we can see and touch and hold, but also to the unseen beings, the multiple, the numerous beings that you have created who exist in the heavens, and even those who are on this earth, the fallen angels. 
Lord, that our lives testify that you are God. Please bless and be with us. Help us to live lives of righteousness, lives of judgment, lives of love. We thank you for who you are. And Father, we thank you that you are our Father. We ask you this prayer in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen.